Hello, good evening. Welcome to the National Parents Union presents the Vet Dukes and Speak Your Truth. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I have to say I was in having a really good nap right before this broadcast started. And I woke up a little bit grumpy when I called in to the producers and to the guests to get everything started. There was so much good energy going and good vibes. Everyone just in such a positive uh, frame of mind. It just lifted my spirits, you know? An encouraging word, laughter, is such good medicine. It really is. So shout out to Jada Bola, our producer for Speak Your Truth. And shout out to Natasha Medjean, producer for Speak Your Truth. <laughs> you really, really um, got the show started off on the right foot tonight. And I'm happy, really, to introduce our guest tonight, um, someone who I know through my husband, as uh, many of the guests that I've had on this show, um, being married to my husband, John, has really given me um, an inside look, if you will, at the impact of uh, incarceration, um, because not only was he incarcerated, but many of the friends that he uh, is around and that I know through him have also shared in that experience. And while that is not the totality of their life experience, it is a significant part of it. And one that um, intrigues me um, and looking at you know, the school to prison pipe pipeline, the role that that intersection of education and incarceration and the impact of incarceration overall on our families, which comprise our communities. What happens when um, tens of dozens of hundreds of thousands of black and brown bodies and minds are removed from our community. What does that do to us? And what does that do to the person who's been re removed? So we're gonna discuss that and so much more tonight with our guest, Mr. Donald Washington Jr. Donald, welcome. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be joining you tonight. Um, as you said, my name is Donna Washington. I was incarcerated for nearly 15 years. During that time, I educated myself coming in with no education, basically, and leaving with a master's degree. Um, while on the inside, I did a number of things to try to connect with the youth because I did many of the things that led to my incarceration during my youth. So I know how vulnerable and how pivotal the youth that that stage of youth is for people in our communities like i said while i was incarcerated i did a number of things to develop and participate in programs with the youth and i'm just happy to be on with you tonight to discuss um my role challenges um and everything as it relates to parenting and you know it's very good to see you outside anytime i have the honor of meeting someone who did time inside and then to see them outside. You're a walking miracle to me because I really can't even fathom in my mind or spirit doing that much amount of time in prison, any length of time. Even visiting prison was traumatic for me for only what many would consider a short amount of time, like four years. I can't imagine doing the amount of time that you've done and even more than that and i hear the numbers that you know these guys throw out like yeah i just did 20 25 27 32 like these are years in a person's life it's a lot you know so thank you for being here um I'm grateful for your life i want to back up a little bit to what you started with initially uh where you said you went into prison basically with no education so at what age did you go in as the teacher in me now has raising it's raising some red flags like well what do you mean you went in with no education weren't you going to school yeah so i actually went in at 20 but i committed the crime that i went in for at 16. so at 16 i was so immersed in a criminal lifestyle that i was able to like live on the run 
let's say for four years. Um, so I, I pretty much came in with like a junior high education because prior to me committing the crimes that led to my incarceration, I wasn't really involved in school at all. Say no more. I understand. I've had students similar, like by eighth grade, ninth grade, they have already exited and are very much outside of school more than inside of school. So now you com committed a crime, you got incarcerated, you had your bid on the run, as you put it, you got incarcerated, you looked at 15 years, you're 20 at that time. That's like yeah. prime. Well, I was looking at life with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Wow. Yeah. You beat a really big case. You, you could have been in life, prison for the rest of your life, potentially, according to that sentence. Yeah. And you had that hanging over your head at 20 years old. So what was that like? Uh, it was pretty bleak. It was pretty bleak. Uh, I would say that the one thing that allowed me to have a sense of having a light at uh, the end of the tunnel, a sense of hope was my education, right? So once I began to in educate myself, I began to, you know, broaden my horizons and, and think toward a future, right? So at 20 years old, you're faced with life in prison. At that time, the New York State governor, I was incarcerated in New York State. The New York State governor was Governor Pataki. Oh, the and the re yeah, the release rates were like very, very mm -hmm. low. Yeah. So the probability of me making it home before me being 50 or so was, uh, wasn't likely. Uh, so it was, it was really a hard pill for me to swallow. And I started off on the wrong path. Um, I came in on the wrong foot and I stayed on that foot for a while. And I would say that education really, really saved my life in a sense. And it's through like a sense of community, like you're going to discuss today on, you know, how you have to really raise a, a child through so many different things. I was fortunate enough to be placed in a facility that had individuals who were from the community that I was from. And those individuals like pulled me to the side and say, well, you know, you got to slow down a little bit, you know, do this or do that. And, you know, as a young person, you look to older people for, for advice, especially people who are from where you're from, who you have a sense of connection with. And that was pivotal. That was the difference. Because yeah. I, I went in with some individuals who are still in, who had the same amount of time, the same length of sentence, mm -hmm. sentenced during the same period of time who could be out now, but they aren't because they didn't benefit from, you know, having those figures around. Yes. Wow. So there, are, there is a huge factor there where we're talking about not just the uh, biological mother and father or the traditional idea of family. We need, have to broaden our scope, our idea of what constitutes a family and what components are needed in order for a, a child, for a human to grow and develop into his or her optimal self. So, you know, um, I saw this through John too and the exposure I had to inside through him. There's a brotherhood inside of prison. I, I often refer to it with things like us um, having phone calls or just like this, this looking out that I know I benefited from because when John was afforded something, it did help us, you know? Can you talk about that brotherhood and specifically how that helped you when you talk about education and this raising up? that you yeah. experienced? I would say uh, prison is a very bleak place as you know, most people can imagine. Um, many individuals come into prison with a lot of damage or baggage, um, having experienced a lot of trauma. That's one thing that you see often in prison is people who are very, very trauma affected, um, who's often been trauma affected for years, probably since childhood. And that's been untreated, unaddressed, and I would say that when you're fortunate, in those instances when you're fortunate, you develop pockets of people who you can have a sense of trust with, a sense of community with. And again, it's, it's not completely rare, but it's, it's really, really hard to develop. Um, it affords you a space where you can kind of breathe, right? So in prison is, you always have to maintain this facade, right? Because being in a maximum security facility, for example, there are people who are there who might be serving 18 months with people who might be serving triple life sentences, right? So 
that guy who's serving at 18 months may come out and you may think that he's carrying the weight of the world. You know, meanwhile, he's counting down the days and he has to maintain that facade of being a tough guy or being whatever. He may, he may even be malingering or pretending to be mentally ill for his own safety. So when you develop pockets of trust with people and a sense of community, it just affords you a space to just let down and be yourself and be vulnerable, right? So, so many people who are in prison and who've been trauma affected have never been in a space where they could be vulnerable and say, well, I feel this way. Like to really be human and say, I feel like this. You know, people don't usually check for you, let me say that. They don't usually check on you to see how you're doing or how you're feeling because they don't know you in prison. So when you develop that sense of community with an individual, um, you can see certain signs and you can check for a person. And that's, that's essential for you to make it out with your sanity or some semblance of a sanity because at a certain point, uh, you lose something. You lose a piece of yourself. You lose a piece of your humanity. And I would say you could gain it back, but it's hard. It's a, it's, a fa it's a battle. So I would say that having a community affords you a space to be human, right? In a place that doesn't allow you to be human. It doesn't even recognize your humanity. Mm -hmm. You're being locked in right. cages. For being human, if yeah. you even exact your hu humanity that's seen as a something worth punishment. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you exert your autonomy in any way, that's mm -hmm. frowned upon by prison staff. So it's just like, it's such an inhumane pay place. Yes. It's, it's necessary to have pockets of space where you could be human and just yes. say, well, this is what I'm going through. This is how I felt today. Or this is what's on my mind. Or this is something just I'm concerned about. Yourself of who you truly are, like to keep plugged in. Like I am, regardless of what this place is showing me, I am a human. I am a man. I am. Yes. Yes. And I am. And also, and, and also for you to maintain that repertoire of language, of feeling, of connecting. Because for me, it's, and I think for most people, it's a challenge already when you come out and you have this experience connecting with individuals. But had you not had a group on the inside that you could connect and be human with, like had you had to maintain that facade. 24 7 mm -hmm. it would be that much harder to connect with individuals on an interpersonal level in society mm -hmm. so you, i mean you just need it it's essential but how, how how did you do it though like how does that work especially as you're saying there is this need for um life or death purposes in some cases to keep up a facade to do whatever you have to do in order to survive how do you know when to allow yourself to be vulnerable, vulnerable. You need that too because that seems would, to be a specific skill yeah i would say it's 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 a trial and everything right mm -hmm. um and sometimes you get burnt and sometimes you, you you're blessed mm -hmm. i would say that depending on what facility you land in that would determine a lot an individual can change a relationship can change from facility to facility there are a number of variables gang affiliation criminal history there are a number of different things that can change how you're able to connect with the individual so let's say you were in a facility with a guy and you two may have been the best of friends to the degree that you could have been in that facility and you meet up again in another facility and let's say you learn something new about that guy maybe he has maybe he has a crime that's frowned upon of mm -hmm. some sort now you have to make the decision of whether or not you're going to maintain that same type of relationship right so when you do connect with the individual and you do associate with them, their baggage becomes your baggage. Mm. So I would say it's just a, it's a trial and everything. Um, having served a long period of time and coming from a community where I'm from East New York and Brooklyn, it's a large number of individuals from East New York and Brooklyn in New York state facilities. Um, so for me, I would say if, for lack of a better word, I was at an advantage of never going to a facility where there was not someone from my community who I could back check and fact check, if you will. Um, but it just takes time, you know, it takes time um, to really develop that trust in the individual. I would say another factor is mental health because individuals do break under the pressure of being in a prison facility. And sometimes it's hard to recognize those signs 
and that may impact you in a certain way. So you, even in those relationships, you still have to be guarded. You have to continuously gauge mm -hmm. what's going on with this person. Um, so. so once you found that community, what were the benefits to you? And at, at what age were you now when you started to settle down a bit and begin to start, you know, growing up? Yeah. All right. I will, I will add one point to this. For me, I, I was moved to a facility where I was able to pursue higher education, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the relationships I was able to form was through higher education programs. So you're talking so about the, the school to prison pipeline because East New York is a school to prison pipeline neighborhood, but now you're referring to the prison to school. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I found myself in those facilities or in, that, in the facility that had those type of programs. And I was able to meet individuals through those type of programs. So that was pivotal. Um, can you re-ask the question one more time? Just to no, make sure I'm answering it. Uh, no, just basically asking you, like, what impact, once you um, became a part of this brotherhood, this community inside, at what age were you and how did it help you? I would say I was about 26. Okay. Uh, for me, it helped me because I was able to redirect that energy, right? So in life, you deal with frustration, you deal with challenges, you deal with adversity. But in prison, you don't have a way to necessarily vent that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it gave me that space. And I like to think I've always been an intelligent person. It just was directed in the wrong ways. So once I found the community of individuals who I could be a nerd around, like it was, it was cool. I can be a nerd. I can read. I love to research things. This is it's what I do for a living now, uh, in part. Um, it was liberating. Um, it meant everything for me, uh, and it became a family of sorts, you know. And that still maintains itself to this day, uh, with individuals both who are in and who are out. Uh, it's it meant everything. It meant all the difference. So, did you have? familial support in the traditional sense while you were incarcerated? I did. Unfortunately, incarceration has been a family tradition of mine for my immediate family. So um, I have seven siblings. Everyone has been incarcerated at some point in time. I have four brothers and three sisters. So it's been a thing that we had grown used to. Fortunately, everyone has made it out and have, no one has recidivated. Um, so my family was kind of abreast of how to address things. Unfortunately, a number of them were incarcerated while I was incarcerated. So that was a challenge. Um, and because of our history of incarceration, there's been like a disconnect. You know, since everyone is out now, we've been able to like really connect. I lost my sister in December. But we were able to like connect, even not after having really having time with each other for most of our most of my life. Yes. Um, so like incarceration, incarceration played a major role in like separating us in a sense. But I I was blessed to have family support to the degree that they can support me mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So I was definitely benefited in that way. Mm. Do, uh you talked about um, what was your education like? What, tell me the impact that it had on you. It sounds like that was a real like watershed moment in your life once you got into your studies. What did yeah. you study? All right, so for my undergrad degree is in behavioral science and that was really, really impactful. Um, I think anytime you're studying behavioral science like psychology and sociology, you automatically try to apply it to yourself. Mm -hmm. which they always suggest you shouldn't do and you really shouldn't do. But it, it, it primarily, I would say initially, let me say, initially sociology, which is something I studied on my own, like mm -hmm. to, to actually get into a college program, you had to already had college credits, which I didn't have. So I had to pay for college courses. I had to study on my own in the field I chose was sociology. And sociology just opened my, my eyes to so many different dynamics that I had seen play out but I didn't realize they were playing out. So just recognizing different social dynamics just helped me, you know, not only just step out of the situation because I was already out being incarcerated, but it gave me a more, 
objective perspective on the dynamics that were happening in my life, in my family, and in my community, mm-hmm. right? So that was just like an eye opener. Like, wow, this is a. Uh, I thought this was just me, you know. But the one thing about any science, when you learn it, and I just love learning. I'm teaching myself things all the time. It's like once you learn the terminology of a thing, it's just like so crazy, right? It's 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 so eye opening. It just it just gives you the tools for everything. Put a name to it, right? Like yeah. okay, I so, so there were different dynamics that were going on in life that once I got the terminology and the concepts behind, I said, wow, I could see this playing out in different ways. I could see how this played out in my life. And then once I got into more like psychology and different developmental things, it opened my eyes to different uh, dynamics in my own life. And in some of the lives of the individuals around me, I began to recognize how many people were trauma affected. I began to work on a mental health unit and being like a pseudo counselor for God. You know, um, it just, it just broadened my horizons. Like I was in prison, like physically I was in prison, but I didn't wake up any day and, and I, I didn't impose a prison upon myself. All right. So every day was another day for me to learn something new, for me to figure something else out. So how um, long did it take to earn um, the degrees that of the 15 years, how many of those years did you have education as a part of your experience it, it took me about seven in total i want to say to get a master's degree to go from ged to master's degree it i would just say just it didn't happen over the course of seven years but i would say seven years in total so uh like i got my i earned my high school equivalency within months of me being like officially incarcerated in New York state. I just went, took the test. Not, not that I'm some grand guy or whatever, but it wasn't that difficult for me. It wasn't that much of a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm really quick with picking different things up. So I would say about seven years. Um, it was a wonderful experience and I feel like higher education should be available in every prison facility, um, as an optional thing. Just because it 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 gives you something to work toward, it gives you something to work on, and it broadens your possibilities once you're out. Yeah. You know, without higher education, I don't know where I would be in my life now. Yes. To so where you know I'm doing things that I had not anticipated doing. I'm learning things that I had not anticipated yes. learning, and I'm excelling in ways that you know without having that base of education, that base of study especially my graduate work, which is from the New York Theological Seminary. Um, I'm a religious person. I don't try to impose my religion on anyone, but that was like really, really huge for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially that that level of work just made life that much easier coming out and just integrating the society and just picking things up. So. Yeah, I agree. I'm really, um, I do advocate for Education, if you're going to incarcerate some, someone and you really mm. are charged with rehabilitating them, you have to include education as a part of that model, as a part of that mm-hmm. program, especially if you want them to have a life, a, a chance at a better quality of life when yeah. they come home. The education piece is important. There's a documentary, um, College Behind Bars by Ken mm-hmm. Burns um, through P- PBS. It talks about a program, um, a college program inside of a prison and the yeah. impact that it has. Shout out to Hudson Link because they're the ones who, um, the organization that pays for um, a lot of the, at least in the... Yeah, that's how I got my undergrad degree right? through, through Hudson League. And Hudson League was really like so much more of a, like a family in a sense. Mm-hmm. And just seeing Hudson League executive director, uh, Sean Pika come in and knowing like this was a guy who was incarcerated in this facility that you're in now. And just like, because so much of you being incarcerated and you surviving is you projecting yourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, you project in so many different ways and to have somebody who came directly from where you're at, it makes it that much easier. Like, I could really be doing this. This guy's doing it. Yes, he's I such a like strong it. model. I agree. And they are a family because even now, like, you can attest to this, I'm sure. John's out, you're out. They still keep in touch. They still have Absolutely. alumni events and, you know, how are you doing? And is this just a family? It's, it's really... 
And it's really beautiful to see that there is that level of care uh, yeah. given to people in a society that, you know, once someone goes to prison, it's like they're ready to be tossed away. Like society is not very welcoming or very nurturing or loving or forgiving of, um, you know, people yeah. who, who go to prison. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Johnny Perez, says felonies are forever. It just seems like once you have it, it's just like always, always there. It's always there. You know? Yeah. You know? So how are you, now that you're out, in what ways do you find yourself giving back to the community? Uh, prior to COVID, I, I've been volunteering as much as possible. Um, so while on the inside with a group of guys, uh, we put on some events for young people. And since we've been out, we've been doing the same, same sort of thing. Um, things are pretty much on hold for now. Um, there's an organization in the community that I come from who I was able to raise money and support while I was on the inside. And, you know, since I've been out, I haven't really been able to engage with them, you know, due to COVID, but that's something I'm definitely a part of. Uh, they actually just lost one of the pillars of that organization, unfortunately. So I'm going to have bigger shoes to fill, but you know, that's a part of life. Um, so talk to us some about the, um, the activism and advocacy work that, that you do. Um, the organization you work for, you're definitely not just yeah. talking the talk, you're walking the walk in a lot of ways as well to make sure you're giving back. Yeah, so I work for the Marshall Project. It's a nonprofit news organization. And as we like to say, focus on changing the narrative of criminal justice. So there are a lot of harsh realities of the criminal justice process and system. And we focus on bringing that to the national stage. Uh, my primary focus, um, in addition to doing a lot of research at this point, is doing some community engagement things, right? So the communities that are primarily affected by mass incarceration are black and brown. And my big goal is just connecting with those families you know, those individuals who are the collateral damage, if you will, because when a person goes to prison, the entire family goes to prison, you know? So it's just like everyone, everyone. Because I hear that phrase being said, you know, time and time again, but could you just elaborate on what that means? When, when yeah. someone goes to prison, the entire family goes to prison? Yeah, so I would say first, because there are so many crimes that are related to monetary gain, I would say first economically that impacts the family, right? So going through the criminal justice process, once you're in, there's this whole notion of bail, right? So can you be bailed out? Can you be released? And, and sometimes that happens and oftentimes that places a huge burden on the families. Sometimes that's not able to happen, right? So I would say the next stage or the thing to look at would be having an attorney and the challenge that that often brings, you know, paying for that, uh, uh, the continuous uh, siphoning of money from the family, if you will, that may or may not result in a conviction, uh, may or may not result in someone's exoneration. Um, once you're inside, now you have appeal attorneys, right? You have phone calls that cost. Um, in New York State, at one point, I think when I first came in, a 30 minute phone call was about $8 in that area. Now it's down to like, I think like a dollar 65. Um, guys are able to send emails. The emails, for example, cost about 30 cents per email now, right? Now just think about the emails are pretty much free, right? So every time you want to email a relative, it doesn't seem like much initially, but I mean, it adds up. It adds up, especially if it's an individual who's from a family who's, who's not wealthy, yep. right? So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is just the, the mental and emotional side of it. Mm -hmm. So when I was sentenced, my family was there, right? So now, one of the things about family is, you know, you're usually protective over family. Mm -hmm. But it's like, once you're in prison, no one can protect you. You have to hold your own. Right, so your, your family, they worry about you. you know, they wonder how are you gonna get through these years? Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like, is it gonna break you? Is something gonna happen? Is it gonna be like Oz or some movie they've seen? 
they they want to know like what are you going to go through and this is anxiety that they have to deal with that they usually don't go to a, a counselor to get processed to say well i have anxiety because my son or my brother or my cousin or my <laughs> uncle is in prison and that the counselor is in awe of the story as if your life is some type of movie plot yeah. i've experienced that was like yo i can't even really talk to you because yeah. you're so out of touch and removed like i'm I'm not Netflix and in, in, in yeah. yeah, this is not this is not the entertainment. Oh, tell, tell me about his cartel. Like, no, this is about me. You don't need all of that backstory. Yeah. I don't need to be a therapist to know you you going too far back. Yeah. Yeah. It's turn it turns into the Sopranos. Yeah. But so that's like that's like a huge thing. And then there's this huge disconnect, right? So I'm visiting family right now. Like I said, it's my mo- it's my mother's birthday for those viewing. Um so I have two nieces in here, right? So two of my nieces are here. I've been out for 20 months now. So I've been gone for most of their lives. Well, actually for all of their lives, right? And it's just like, now that I've been out for a while, I've been making a concerted effort. Like they've gotten to know me, but that's been like a process. So like, who is this guy? Like he looks familiar, but who is this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, like that's like a huge process. So you miss things. You're not able to give that extra gift, gift on Christmas or on a birthday that might make a difference. Yeah. to someone um i mean it might make a difference for the child or the parent or both mm-hmm. um so that's like huge i have one nephew who me and him are really really close i'm close with all of my nieces and nephews but one i'm, I'm you know sometimes you're closer with some people more than others yeah and i wasn't there for most of his like adolescence you know i wasn't there to answer questions and for him to go to me for guidance and yeah that that can take a toll you know, it's just like you make the decisions you make and you should be held accountable for those decisions, but it impacts more than just you. Yeah. So that's what I mean by, you know, your entire family is, is going through that with you. They, it's no way for them not to feel. There's no way for them not to worry or be concerned. So well put. And there, there's little um, compassion on the outside as well. The family carries that stigma also. Um, even in a neighborhood, well, maybe in a neighborhood where um, going to prison is more normalized, unfortunately, you might, it might not be as frowned upon, but in other circles, definitely, it can become a part of your life that's compartmentalized, that you might not, like people could be around you, but not know that you have a spouse who's incarcerated or a son, or because you like, at this part of my, I don't even want anyone here to know about it. And that is like spiritually inside. That doesn't feel good either. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So those so are, I have an experience that I could imagine it, but mm-hmm. I know that even like coming out, that's like a dynamic that people have to deal with now. Like is when people like, ask like, well, it, how did you meet this person? Or where have you been? Or how long have you guys been dating? Those are like questions to ask. And mm-hmm. That's like a huge challenge. Have you had barriers in dating? Because you're single. So, like, what is it like now that you're out and you're dating? Um, I mean, that's, like, a huge thing. Like, where have you been for all of these years? Okay. Um, I would say, like, to touch on relationships first, like, coming out and coming out and dating and having that experience. It's just, like, for people who knew you prior they wonder how you are, how prison has changed you, if it's changed you for better or for worse. So that's like a ongoing thing. And then when you meet someone new and maybe they have potential mate or date, it's just like, so you were in prison for 15 years? Like, where do you introduce that, that yeah. portion of it, right? And then it's just like, the follow-up question is, for what, what happened? Why was the reason, you know what I mean? Mm. And then usually the next question is like, did you do it or, you know, and then it's like, all the other questions. Everything come, come becomes about answer. that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I mean, for me, it doesn't necessarily make me uncomfortable mm-hmm. because, like, I own it. I'm responsible for why I was incarcerated. I, mm-hmm. I wasn't one of the individuals who were incarcerated, you know, unjustly, though I know many individuals who have been. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I own it and I understand that that's just a part of what I have to deal with. Um, but in all relationships, it's, it's a challenge. Like even in church relationships, it's a challenge. Um, for me, I would say my circumstance is a bit more unique, uh, communally, like in church, but 
it's it's a challenge with any person you know and you meet and I don't usually lead with it and I don't shy away from it, but if it's brought up, I'll I'll expound on it. So th- that's just like a huge challenge for relationships. Like, do you ever redirect the conversation? Like, you know, I just feel like we've talked about it enough. Do you ever have those types of interactions where you feel? No, like but, no because I, I, know, I know people are, are curious and I know people have questions and I want to give them my honest, you know, experience. Because I'd rather a person ask me 10 million questions than just go off something that they've seen on TV, okay. you know, because, you know, there's so many different facets to, to incarceration and, and I'm just one person. So my experience is, is individual. Of course. But I, I feel like I want to, I want you to know my experience. If you want to know about incarceration, I want you, I, w- I want you to hear my side of what this is. So any questions you might have about it, I'm okay with answering. Even if those questions make me feel uncomfortable, I feel like it's my obligation in a sense because a, I feel like the perception of individuals who are incarcerated is, I wouldn't say completely out of touch, but it's not everyone. Like you can't just, you can't just say everyone is this or everyone is that, or, you know, it's like, you know, we're human beings. So we're nuanced like everyone else, mm-hmm. you know? So it's important to me that people know that for myself and for individuals who are still on the inside, who aren't being able, who aren't able to be released maybe by virtue of their crime being violent. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you define violent crime? That's a whole nother, you know, discussion for another day. But I feel like people's perceptions are are negative and I understand why, but you know, they, people need to be a little bit more considerate. And part of that is not having the experience of interacting with somebody who's been incarcerated. So if I can speak to that, I will. So you want to humanize their per- perception and give like a, a name and a face because I do a- agree with you. Oftentimes when people say are doling out these long prison sentences, I'm like, are you attributing this number to an actual life? You know, like it's not just, oh, 25 years is a large chunk of time doesn't yeah. take that long to learn the things that need to be learned in order to reintegrate into society. That is supposed to be the goal of the punishment. Yeah. You, in you particular, know? when you're dealing with young people, yes. who I would say make up a large percentage of violent crimes, are uh, primarily young people who aren't like completely developed, um, who when they interact with the prison system are treated as adults, but they would not be treated as adults in any other sphere of life. You know what I mean? They may not even be old enough to see an R rated movie, but they're old enough to get a life sentence. You know what I mean? So it's like, you're not responsible enough to drink, but you're responsible enough. So it's just. Yeah. And they need guidance. That's really what it is at a time when it's like, you know, there's a lot going on and they made a poor choice. And we just have to, I think, get back in touch with who and how, who we were and how we were when we were yeah. younger, when we were their age. Yeah. And not forget that time in life. It's not to give a pass, but definitely a pass is given to some and not to others. And that's definitely. the inequity part. Everyone's kids aren't getting locked up. It's only certain kids that are going through it and getting in the system for things that you have to wonder, like, did, did it really warrant all of that? Yeah, and I mean, like, to, to speak to that, like, you graduate to higher crimes, right? So it's like, before I was in a maximum security facility serving a life sentence, I was a younger person, and I was placed in other situations. I remember being incarcerated for something that was just, like, completely fictitious, and it's like, I'm in Spofford, and I'm dealing with all the things you have to deal with, and then all the trauma that comes with that and you come out and you haven't processed this experience and you're upset about this or that, or you have a chip on your shoulder and that leads to other things. So I totally agree with you. Wow. I totally agree with you. Wow. It's wonderful to just have your advocacy to speak to that, you know, for people yeah. that are just out of touch and unaware and not having that human connection. So thank you for providing that. And as you see, 
we have our co-host. Good to see you. Hello, how you doing? Good to see you, uh, Donald. Good to be here. Good to be here. I'm glad you were able to hop on. Yeah, no, I appreciate your transparency because I know I didn't hear what was going on, but I do know this. Mm -hmm. For those that, yes, I know. For those that are, you know, viewing, you're not as transparent and not because you're, you know, deceitful about it or, you know, being deceitful, but you're a person that you do, when you give, you give to people in, in, in a way that they know that it's value to it, that you add to them. And I appreciate you taking the time out tonight, man, because you do a lot of things that I don't know if y'all even discuss, you know, like things that you do with um, his, his video shooting and stuff like that. No, talk uh, about it. Yes. So I guess, I mean, Donald looks like we're done with our part of the no. talk now. <laughs> and uh, you and John are about to kick it, so go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would like for you to tell some of the viewers that, you know, the amazing things that you've been doing with, uh, doing your own directing, you know, center for talk, you know. You, yeah, you, I mean, you, um, it. again, it just goes back to just learning, like learning new things, teaching yourself. Um, one of the things I've been surprised by is just like falling in love with cinematography since I've been out and shooting video and editing video to the point where I'm now doing it professionally for the Marshall Project um, on a junior type basis, but. Uh, it wasn't something that I had envisioned for myself. And again, that's, that goes back to the whole idea of education and why receiving an education while I was on the inside has been pivotal because it's just like, these are experiences that other communities get, you know, their children get to, their young people get to experience them early on. So it's just like with anything else, you have to build confidence. You have to have those, those, those steps you take. Um, for me, being in and educating myself to the degree that I was. It just let me know that, let me know that I could just, you know, I could take on any challenge. Um, and I just continue to educate myself, man. It just, it doesn't stop. I you just, know, just jump in one second and say, you are really warming my heart, the teacher in me, because you are the poster child right now for what I profess and what I truly believe, that through education, through exposure, you brought in people's minds, and it allows them to make better choices in life because Absolutely. they see more. And the younger you are, and when you're groomed that way, it does help you. Yes, trauma is still trauma, and things are going to happen in life. There's no perfection, but education is key because you, when you know something, something you have a confidence inside mm -hmm. it does something to you it gives you that swag like this and we don't groom that enough in our kids like you're going to school and being smart and just doing well it's really fly we don't push it like that it's looked down upon it's like oh you're acting white and i wish we would stop in circles where that happens it's so damaging because mm -hmm. education is the key listen to what you said while you were inside, it's education that really like did it for you. And I can only imagine if you were getting the proper education when you were in elementary school and junior high school, you would not have gone to prison. I believe that even in the most dire of circumstances that could have broken cycles. But the, in, in East New York, were the schools good at that time either? No, the schools usher you right into prison. Yeah. They're not really, yeah, they don't really. care, you know? And I'm not generalizing, but for the most part, this is what we see happening. That's why there's a school to prison pipeline from seven neighborhoods because the education system is failing. And East New York is one of those neighborhoods, unfortunately. Where's the money going into those schools? Where are the top teachers in those schools? Where's pump, you know, it's not there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going no, off a no, little no, right now, great. but that's, this that's, is that's, like real life about. for all the posters and all the stats. This is a real human being we're talking no, about. No, you made here. you made me think about something like when I was in economic e economics class on um, at Mercy College. Shout out to Professor Skalskin. Uh, he in his class he would bring in like money currency from different places he had went to, and he would always say like, you know, oh, this is where I came from. I had a red eye you know to today when i came in and there were a few of our peers that really didn't understand that at the time some was like they were grappling with it in a way where it was like um well yo is he showing off or is he you know like 
and not not because they were trying to bad mouth, they really couldn't con- couldn't comprehend what he was really doing. He was giving them exposure, and for one, he was being honest, just saying what he was doing. He was living his life. He was telling you, "Oh, I just went here and I just came back here," and then he would use it as a teachable moment. Why I brought that up is because in doing so, he allowed us to be exposed to other things that we perhaps were never exposed to and we would never get exposed to just by us being in the setting we was in for one being in prison and then also uh, by by um just not having these type of conversations where they're just not enough at our dinner table you know to say the least because it's generations of generations that most of us come from i know i can speak for myself personally that have not had that um privilege you know, if it, it shouldn't even be a privilege. It's not a privilege. It shouldn't to even have be a family. right to have yeah. a, to have that to have it's a that, right. It's like a to human have that right. birthright to 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 explore other mm-hmm. possibilities that you brought up. You know, you you made a great point. That's what got me charged up. Mm-hmm. You made a great point. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. that's, thank you, Donald, because your experiences are so rich, and you know. Yeah, I'm, I thank you guys for having me on. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah Donald has yeah. done all. Um, I, I'm not. I want to let you get away because Donald has done some amazing things just by oh, not yeah, only being about yeah, not only being it. inside, right? But um, <laughs> you know, which is which is which has been a feat within itself. But um, tra- the transitioning part, the the, the reacclimating to society, whole that whole coming back as a citizen and really taking the 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 ownership of his life has really been inspiring even for me, you know? And um, I watched Donald on numerous occasions, like, yo, I'm doing this. He's maybe working like two jobs, you know? Uh, one time I called uh, Mr. Washington, he said, oh, I'm at the church uh, helping out, giving hey. out a volunteer, volunteer, yeah, point, you, know? <laughs> you know, feeding the people. That's in. what I'm talking and, um, about. No matter what denomination you're in, to be able to give yourself like that, you know, that is that that is something to be shouted out for, and um, that's what I wanted to take the time to do tonight by coming in because I wasn't going to come in and sit down at first because I was like, you know, you know, let you know this is her show and this was our show, but, but your friend, yeah, that's but what I, I was said, like, I said, let, let, whatever, let, 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 yeah, because I I know most of the answers, you know, so I said mm-hmm. I said I mean I know all the answers, but I know I most guess. of the answers if if you was to ask them something that you don't know and you don't know about them. So I was just like, you know what, I, I'll chill. But um, I couldn't help myself <laughs> after after um, walking past a few times. So, after you know he what, heard us vibing, Donald, <laughs> is what he's saying. I'm glad, I'm glad he joined in, though. I'm glad he joined in. I got to see him. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Um, That's good. Yeah. Uh, but so, so again, would you like to, do you have any um, thoughts or, or any remarks about your business that you do do on the side, in a sense? Is that... Um, I I really don't want to plug anything right now just because I'm like I'm I'm booked up with work. Yeah. Um but I would say that, that's a blessing. That's like a huge blessing. That's wonderful. That's a that's good like a huge blessing. Have, I would say it's just I just it just to me it just speaks to the power of education because it's like I came out and I I, I taught myself how to use technology that I, I never even knew existed. You know what I mean? I, I learned how to edit videos at a high level to the level that I'm doing it now professionally. That's all self-taught. Um, you went to no class, yeah, nothing. No no classes, what anything. You and just, YouTube, like how did you teach yourself? with, with Yeah, YouTube, YouTube, just reading articles. Learning people, I'm telling you, there are kids just that, that, that learn Autodidactive like- learning is just like, you know, and like you spoke on Professor Skousen, who was like, I, I had one of his courses, a small business course, and he just speaks economics. And he just yes. like, I learned a lot of things from him. And that's, that's helped me with other endeavors that I'm, you know, I've ventured off into just like with stocks and different things. Did and it's just like, just, Shaw? Uh, hmm? did you have oh. Professor Shaw? I no, I didn't. Graduated by oh, okay. Her. She came in a lot of professors. Well, yeah. Shout out Professor Mickey Shaw. But there's two, there's two Professor Scousers that you, you did meet, uh, oh. one of them, I think, or both. Sorry but, um, to interrupt. And that's the English thing. That's a, yeah, that was your real connection because she's an English professor. Oh. Yeah, you, you and her were. Yeah, Professor Scousen, yeah. <laughs> really good. Yeah. 
So yeah. well, go ahead. I didn't yeah. mean to cut you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just was saying it just it just speaks to the power of education. Like it's mm-hmm. been a blessing, you know. Wow. It's been a blessing. Well. Yeah. Unless you have anything else, do you have other things, child? You no, saw I, you came on ready to rearing to go. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> I, I wanna, I wanna hit you with somebody, but that's different. That's a different conversation. See, I'm not the man. Yeah, look, look, yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah, whoa, whoa, this man is a good whoa. man. You know, look, he's a good man. And thank you, John. You know, thank um, you, man. And I know you're gonna be a great parent. You know, and I know yeah. that this. This, the, the, the reality of this is, is that in doing an interview like this and, and speaking about education, speaking about a future parent or, and a parent in a sense that you, you do help out with other children. You know, we all yeah, have. Absolutely. And, um, and, 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 and you know what? You you're that you that guy, man. I mean, you're that candidate. Now that you're John that introduced the topic, this yeah. is I'm being respectful. Do you want children? I mean, I'm curious. Do you want to be a biological parent? Um, I would say yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm fearful in the sense of it's just like, you know, this world is not generous to black children, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so like that's like a real fear for me. Just like just the different things that I've seen and experienced. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't have any faith in humanity or our society, but I, I do think about that. Like if I were to bring a child into this world, like what would I be bringing them into? Wow. That's something I do think about. That's real. You know, because I see how society has treated our children, our children. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's rough, you know? So I want to, but I'm fearful. You know, I, I don't know what other way to explain it besides that. Like, I'm just fearful, man. That's so touching. That's so real. That hurts just to hear that because I didn't have those thoughts when I had children. Nothing I even had to think about. Just, you know? Yeah. I, I just, for me, just like, but that's I guess growing up as a kid in East New York and seeing different things and, you know what I mean? And it's just like, it's it's difficult. Um, and I'm probably also losing my father at at a, a young age. You know, that's just like a dynamic. And I'm a great uncle. I know that. I'm an excellent uncle. I got this uncle thing figured out. So the, you know, I'm the best. I'm the best. Yeah. You know? Um, I think I'll make a great dad if and when the time comes. You know, if if it's what God wants for me, then it doesn't even matter what I think or feel about it. It's just going to happen that way. And, you know, so... I just walk by faith and, you know, if, if the time is right and the person is right and then everything is right, then it'll happen. Nice. You, you know, what, what comes to mind is that you being a good mm-hmm. son, you know, how oftentimes we have spoke about our mothers and things like that. And um, even when you came home, you was like, that wasn't really an option. Like, I'm not trying to live with my mom. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And yeah. you went through your struggles. You know, I don't know if you yeah. even you know, spoke about that, and you don't have to right now, but I only brought it up because you were a, a survivor, but no, not a survivor, only a survivor, but you have triumphed over any struggle and obstacle that came your way when it was pertaining to uh, your, 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 your self-reliance, or, or let's say your, 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 um, your journey to, to get jobs or to, to, to persevere at, at life in general. Mm-hmm. And you, you overcame those, those stats, mm-hmm. you know? And mm-hmm. I don't know if you would share how you did it for some people that may be going through that mm-hmm. tonight, but um, yeah. I'm, I, I would like you to share some of those things, you know, at least something. Why don't yeah, we absolutely. move with that actually? Cause that sounds like a really great mm-hmm. place to anchor tonight. Like, what did you do to yeah. survive? I mean, I would say first I got to get a glory to God. Like, you know, it's not I've been able to just do on my own. That's just what it is. Um, and that's like the first thing I did when I came out was like, I want to find a strong church family and connect in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just say persistence, right? It's just like, I feel like no matter what circumstance I encounter, I've already encountered the hardest circumstance for me to thrive in. And I've thrived in it. Um, but that's just the mentality right it's just about being persistent it's like these are the things i want these are the things i need these are my goals 
and I'm going to figure out a way to get to them, you know, and I'm still striving. I'm still pushing and pursuing. And I think it's just about researching, right? That's a huge thing because there are so many resources available. So initially when I came out, um, the powers that be did not want me to like be around my family because of the uh, incarceration history, which I shared with Vivette earlier. And it's like, that was like a major blow. Like, oh, what am I going to do now? So it's just like, okay, they sent me to the worst possible place they could send me to in terms of a men's shelter and the conditions there. And it's just like, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to make the most of this. You know what I mean? I'm going to incorporate this in my program of life. And this is not going to be a burden at all. I'm not even going to worry about the circumstances surrounding me. Because though I am living and I am present in the moment, I know what the future holds for me. And I know that what God wants for me, I'm going to get. Right. It's just about just going to get it, you know, because like you got to put the, you got to put the work in. Yes. You know? So every day I just try to put the work in. Mm. Try to put the work in. Gotta well, you got it, uh, Mr. Washington. I see you sitting Thank real you. good back there now. Ain't no shelter Thank now, you. but that's for sure. Thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm working on some other things too. But you know, it's it's just about being persistent and, and always having those goals in mind and, and always saying, Well, this is what I want to do. So everything needs to be consistent with what that goal is. You know, because it's easy to be distracted, like those it's it's small, subtle distractions that just take you off course. You know, because it might be one misstep here, one delay there, and then the next thing you know, it's just like two years later and you're not where you wanted to be because you made all of those little pit stops along the way. And they didn't seem like anything at that, that time, but time was just up. passing by. Yeah. You didn't accomplish. Just passing by. Yeah. yeah. You can't, you can't give yourself excuses. You can't reward yourself right away. Mm. You gotta just keep going, you know? So. Wow. Thank you for that though. Wonderful. Absolutely. Well, I have nothing else to say after that. Thank you, Mr. Donald Washington Jr. Thank you to all of you for viewing us. The National Parents Union presents Speak Your Truth with John and Vivette Dukes. We thank you. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next next time. Good night. Good night. Take care.